Judge Limbaugh, thank you for joining us today and sitting down with us to share a little bit about your memories when it comes to the profession of the law in Missouri and also the history of the Missouri Bar. So thank, thank you. you. First off, let's start at the very beginning, if you will. Why did you decide to become a lawyer? I enjoyed uh, public speaking and uh, interaction with people. And uh, early on, actually, uh, the plight of some people because they couldn't afford lawyers and, and uh, legal services uh, are generally performed unbeknown to people by most lawyers. Uh, somebody comes in and they help them without charging them if they have a pr legal problem. Uh, that's independent of an of a public group like uh, Legal Services of Eastern Missouri. But they do do that and all of those things I think helped. Of course my dad was a lawyer, my brother was a lawyer and that, that was an impetus because I had great admiration for both of them. Do you have memories as a child of seeing your father practice law? I do. I remember one time uh, uh, we were going to Boy Scout camp at Camp Llewellyn and uh, we got a ride home on a Saturday after we'd been there for two weeks and I stopped by on the ride home at Fredericktown, Missouri and Dad had been trying a case up there and it held over on a Saturday and he made a closing argument and I got to hear it on the way back and I thought it was really Excellent, and that was an impetus to 13 years old. <laughs> you mentioned a minute ago being a young lawyer in 1951. Is that the year that you were enrolled in the bar? September the 1st, 1951, <laughs> yes. Did you, were you, did you take your oath uh, to be officer of the court here in Cape Girardeau, or did you go to the, did they have enrollment ceremonies at the Supreme Court? Uh, I think they had an enrollment ceremony. Uh, Traveling and expense going to Jefferson City, as it always is, was paramount. So they had a provision that you could be sworn in by the circuit court uh, where you resided and practiced. And so I was sworn in just a few blocks from here and the Court of Common Police still call that. Uh, no longer has that kind of jurisdiction. But very fortunate that the judge then swore me in here in Cape Girardeau. Fantastic. Where did you start off your practice at? I, I started, fortunately, with my family office. My, my dad uh, was in the office and my brother and then two other people, so I was the fifth person in the office then. Was that the Limbaugh Law Firm at that time? Yes, ma'am. And still going strong today? It's still going. I'm, <laughs> I can't com comment on how strong, but they're doing all right. Fantastic. And I understand that you recently moved back here from the St. Louis area and have your office at the Limbaugh Law Firm. I do. They were very nice to do so. I'd, I'd, I'd been in St. Louis for about 30 years mm -hmm. and uh, my wife had died and so I have two sons who are pretty permanent in Cape Girardeau and it was better to be back where family is. And then when my old office offered me a job, I, I was happy to accept. <laughs> Things come full circle, don't they? It was a full <laughs> circle, yes. Um, what type of uh, areas of law did you practice in? Or being a lawyer in a smaller town in Missouri, does that mean you practice a little bit of everything? General yes, practice? back in the 50s, uh, anybody that came in the front door, most lawyers tried to accommodate them whatever their problem was. And with time, uh, it's become a little more specialized, even, even in outstate areas, Missouri and everywhere. Uh, but mostly at that point, uh, it was uh, litigation, uh, disputes of all kinds. Uh, the auto industry was in full swing then, and automobile accidents were a glore and uh, then a lot of estate planning for people. Uh, wills, trusts weren't that fashionable then, but uh, uh, 
uh, nor were living wills. Mm -hmm. But uh, all of that evolved more into uh, of a specialty. And, and there are lawyers now, outstate Missouri, who are in a small firm and, and they pretty well restrict uh, what they're doing, either to some kind of uh, business law or to litigation, bankruptcy, and so forth. Did your um, practice have you seeing a lot of drive time to neighboring county seats and courthouses, or did you get to primarily just practice here in Cape? The entire southeast Missouri, everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, uh, a, a lot of people prefer to have a lawyer out of the area where they reside. So occasionally you would get business from uh, some people in uh, Bloomfield, Kennett, Crothersville, Perryville, that are not in Cape Girardeau, but they they like a little more anonymity when they're going to see a lawyer, although they should have that anyway. Yes. Could you tell me uh, or describe a typical day of what it was like to practice law in the early 1950s, especially maybe if you were handling a case in another county? How would you file court documents? How would you get a hold of clients? Right. Uh, today you have electronic filing, e-filing, which is really nice. But uh, then you had to file all of your pleadings in person. So you simply went to the courthouse to file a, a pleading or did it by mail. And, and lawyers occasionally procrastinate to meet a deadline. So mail isn't always uh, you have to bail it several days or, or more before the deadline. So if you miss that, you, the mail, then you have to do it in person. But you can mail it if, if you uh, get your work done in time, that the mail will get you there before the deadline. Something also that many of us see today is advertising for lawyers and specialty areas. As you mentioned, many lawyers restrict the types of cases that they take. Did you have advertising back then, or was it word of mouth? It was word of mouth. Uh, there was an occasional advertisement, but it was, it was word of mouth generally. And uh, I remember uh, sometimes lawyers in the telephone directory would have their firm name in bold type. And my dad wouldn't have anything of that, so. <laughs> But there was very little advertising until we got into the 60s and 70s, and it's too bad. Do you remember any early cases or maybe your first case where you actually got to present at court? I do. The first case I tried was uh, in Bloomfield, Missouri, which is in Stoddard mm -hmm. County, uh, an easy hour's drive from Cape Girardeau. Well, not an easy, but you... <laughs> You could get there in an hour. And uh, I tried it before Judge uh, James Billing. And Judge Billing was one of the ones that was supported by the Pendergast machine giving rise to the adoption of the Missouri Bar Plan. And he was a very interesting gentleman. And he ran for the Supreme Court at that point, it was supported by the Pendergast machine, and then he was defeated and then the Missouri Bar Plan developed from that. But he was still a circuit judge at that time, and he was, uh, oh, he was probably in his late 60s then. Was it a good day in court for you? And I'm your sorry? Client? Was it a good day in court for you and, and your client? Yes, it was, it was very interesting. It was, it was an impossible case. It was one of these little things where a little 12-year-old uh, girl, girl ran out from between two parked cars and no stop uh, signs or warnings or anything. She just ran out and the car hit her. Mm. And uh, fortunately, she was not seriously injured, but she had injuries. It was a very hard case to make. <laughs> so. Do you have um, other cases that have kind of stuck with you or that you are either really proud of or that you just have fond memories of or maybe were tough cases but you've held close to your heart and have impacted your experiences since then that you'd like to share? Yes, very much so. Uh, actually, uh, 
we, uh, our office uh, became involved in a lot of condemnation work in the uh, 60s. Uh, route 61 and 67 was the only route from Cape Girardeau to St. Louis. You go through Farmington mm -hmm. and drive up two lanes. And so 55, I, Interstate 55 came into being then. And uh, uh, much of the land uh, was in controversy that was being taken by eminent domain, condemnation. So uh, we tried a lot of those cases. For example, a farmer had his, let's say, a 300 acre farm and it was cut in two with I-55. And so how that farmer could get on, on an interstate from one side to the other where his farm was uh, created substantial damage to him. So there were a lot of those that we tried. And then we also tried a lot of cases in the Ozark City Riverway project. That was the project where the government uh, condemned all of the land. Uh, well, it's about a, a, a half a mile on each side of Current and Jacks Fork River. And uh, uh, th those uh, were really coveted by the owners then. And the owners didn't want to surrender that wonderful, wonderful area of land, but they were required to by law. So we represented a lot of the landowners in condemnation. And in that area, uh, starting up with Dent County and in, in, in Rolla and then coming south all the way to the Arkansas border where the uh, uh, current river flowed, it was in the geographical area of the southeastern division of the Eastern District of Missouri. So all of those cases were tried here in Cape Girardeau. So we did a lot of that condemnation work. And uh, uh, again, uh, we did a lot of representation of uh, legal defense of uh, uh, medical malpractice. And so we, we did a lot of different kind of work. Now, you mentioned the southeastern division, division of, of the, the Eastern, Eastern District, District of, of Missouri. Missouri. Right. Now, the federal courthouse here in Cape Girardeau, yes. am I correct that it's been dedicated in recent years and has Limbaugh as the name on it? Uh, yeah, that was very nice. Of uh, It was uh, uh, Congressman Bill Emerson mm -hmm. uh, was the impetus to very nicely asking that the courthouse be named. And uh, the, it was uh, worked out so that uh, I, th I think he, he had the same aspirations for the new bridge. So it was the, the Bill Emerson Bridge and, and the Rush Limbaugh Courthouse. But, but the, uh, just real quick, the Eastern District of Missouri uh, is an irregular line that starts from the uh, northern district uh, next to Iowa and then goes south to the northern district of Arkansas. Everything east of that line is the eastern district. West is the western district with headquarters in Kansas City. So St. Louis is the principal office for the eastern district and then they have a division that we're talking about, the southeastern division in Cape Girardeau, a northern division in Hannibal. So there are about, oh, I can't remember the number of counties, perhaps 16 or 17 counties in the southeastern district, much similar to the congressional boundary. Okay. And when you served as a federal judge, were you based out of the main headquarters, the eastern district yeah, in I, St. My, Louis? Yeah, my principal office was in uh, St. Louis, but I handled all of the uh, Cape Girardeau cases okay. as well. The docket wasn't quite as heavy then. I think they had oh, maybe 75 to 100 cases ordinarily, but now they have three or 400. Oh, wow. So it and did, were you assigned to specific types of cases or did no, you preside over? So all civil and criminal, everything but bankruptcy. There, was a, there is a bankruptcy judge in the federal system and the bankruptcy judges are exclusively uh, oriented to that type of of problem. 
do you believe that your experience in handling a variety of cases um, helped you when you became a judge having to handle a variety yes, immeasurably of cases. and there is a dispute about that today I am a firm believer that a, a person can be a better judge if they've had a lot of trial experience as a litigant and a lot of people are being nominated today who have very little uh, some of them become very good judges and some in my opinion do not so I, I think it's an important ingredient and it's a debatable issue. Um, when you say it's an important ingredient, are there specific aspects of it that you want to share that helped you it personally? Well, the fact that you've simply tried a lawsuit. You know where the courthouse is. You know how, you, ho you hope you know how to try a lawsuit simply because you've done it. And so you know the lawyers and it's a lot easier to get into a, a judgeship where you make important decisions if you know what the rules are, you've followed them, you've practiced them, you've used them, and uh, it's much easier to adapt, I think, at being uh, an efficient judge. So the Missouri plan, um, which voters put in place in 1940, is actually older than the Missouri bar as an organization, we were formally transitioned from an association to the Supreme Court's Missouri Bar in 1944. And Charles Carr was the first president of the bar. Did you ever get to meet Mr. Carr in your uh, early years as a lawyer? Uh, I didn't uh, up until the time I became a lawyer. Okay. But he was a good friend of my dad's. He, he was one of the top flight Kansas City lawyers and he frequently wrote articles for the the journal the Missouri Bar Journal and he's just a well-respected gentleman in Kansas City I know dad thought he was just top-notch and uh, just the appropriate person to become president Fantastic. of the bar and then your father followed suit just a few years later as an uh, early president of 1956 the, yeah, of the Missouri Bar yes. um, right. and you were a lawyer at that point I was um, did you get to do you have any memories of his time as serving as president did he happen to travel the state a bit more or I did be more active at the Capitol yeah he was really uh, uh, oh he, he had so many things going then that I don't know how he practiced law because a, a year later, he was chairman of the uh, section that was then called the Real Property Probate and Trust Law Section of the ABA, the American Bar Association. Mm -hmm. So he was president of the Missouri Bar one year and then went into that job with the ABA the next year. And he was very, very busy. He, he did, uh, as was the practice then and is now. Uh, the presidents of the bar uh, go around the state and address various local bar associations. And, and he did a lot of that. He was never home. So a lot of extra work for you and your brother that year. Well, that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> what made you decide to follow in his footsteps and also serve on the Board of Governors and then become a president of the bar? I simply felt that it is the responsibility of every lawyer to be involved with the, an unorganized bar. Uh, many lawyers disagree with that, and that's their privilege. But I think it's a duty of a lawyer to uh, uh, sponsor an organized bar which provides so many services for an integrated bar. Uh, as you know, the journal that is published is absolutely an excellent work that is beneficial to lawyers. They have many things that are written by scholars and by practicing lawyers that are helpful and keep everybody up to date. Uh, there are so many other things that the organized bar does, and it's just a fine service to lawyers. And you meet the other lawyers, the people you're going to practice against. And it's just good to know somebody from St. Joseph when you're a resident of Cape Girardeau. 
So it, it's, it's just, I think, not only essential, I think it's an obligation of lawyers to be involved with the bar. And of course, so, some of my dad's points of view rubbed off on me in, in attaining that point of view, but it, it, it's just inherent, I think, in lawyers to be involved. Uh, one of the problems is young lawyers uh, they're trying to make a living, they're raising a family, and, and it's difficult to be away. But it does require traveling, but uh, it's beneficial in the long run. They can work it out domestically. What are some of your favorite memories of your time as a member of the Board of Governors or as president of the bar? Traveling around the state, yeah, as we discussed. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so interesting to meet uh, lawyers from uh, both outstate Missouri and uh, Kansas City and St. Louis and Springfield. Springfield is now a city, obviously. Uh, and, and then to meet somebody from Neosho, Missouri, as I indicated, uh, are up in uh, Memphis, Missouri, if anybody's ever heard of that. Judge Weber's from Memphis. He is. Uh, uh, Richard Weber. And uh, you meet people there, they're wonderful people. And not only that, it could be a business getter. If you meet somebody in uh, Kansas City and they've got a problem in s Southeast Missouri, chances are they'll call you for help. If uh, I have a problem in Kansas City, I know a number of lawyers there, I would contact one of them for assistance. You need to do that. But it's, just working in the bar and, and doing all of the things that the bar does and you meet all these people, it's, it's refreshing. And uh, contrary to what some of the pundits say, it's a great bunch of people. Just a fine bunch of people. Lawyers are good. It's, it's like so many of the uh, people say about your lawyer or your congressperson. You like your own, but you don't like them as a whole. I've heard that before, and it seems to be the, the perception that people have, isn't it? Yes. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit, you talked about it being a great group of people. How important is um, civility in the profession? Um, as I observe it, c lawyers are very civil um, to one another and can mm -hmm. still be civil, but yet be a zealous advocate for their client. Can you talk about how um, your experience in meeting people through the bar and your experience practicing here um, in Cape Girardeau relates to civility. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, unfortunate. I used to remember when I'd talk to an older lawyer, he'd say, well, in my day, but when I be first became a lawyer, I thought lawyers were much more civil to each other and, and to the court than they are today because uh, civility is, oh, it's so essential. And uh, there are some lawyers who unfortunately digress uh, from that characterization. But it, it, it uh, using the word characterization, it, it is your character. And it, it's not just because you should do it because you're a lawyer, or because you're before a court or in the court. You should be that way with everybody. Uh, of course, there are times when tensions run high and you lose your aplomb occasionally. But by and large, it's, it's just essential for lawyers to be civil. And, and most of them are. But there are occasions when it gets out of hand and it's too bad. Do you think involvement in a bar, or even if it's just on a committee level or such, or one of our community groups, such as the solo and small firm community group, does that help build relationships and improve civility in the I profession? I think so. I think so. Because, well, you develop friendships, and uh, you know, it's, it's biblical almost. You like to uh, treat others as they would have you treat them, or you would have them treat yourself, whatever. The golden rule, right? The golden rule, yes. Um, I wanted to 
touch base a little bit. In 1965, the Missouri Bar moved from a small office up on High Street to its very own headquarters, which we are still located at today, uh, at 326 Monroe Street in Jefferson City. And it, it was a fabulous building, still is. And um, my understanding is that it was built through the donations of lawyers. And I was just curious if you have any recollection as to when that happened in the 60s and maybe what brought about lawyers deciding that they wanted their own headquarters. Yes, you know, you brought up a subject and I'm trying to think of the gentleman who was the uh, executive of the bar then. Oh, Harry, wait, Harry wait, Rooks. Wait. Oh, Harry Rooks, okay. Harry Rooks. And I remember uh, Dad talking about being with him on the upstairs of that building you're referring <laughs> to. And, and then the funds were amassed to build an independent building, which was wonderful. And one of the reasons I remember one of my close friends, an associate uh, judge who was a federal district judge in Kansas City, his name was Joseph Stevens. And uh, he was either the president of the bar then, or about to be, or had been. But he led the drive. And he did a wonderful, wonderful job. And uh, the lawyers supported it, as they should have. And I do know that um, we have what's called the Missouri Bar Board of Trustees. And they actually own the building that we then lease as our headquarters. Um, and have made wonderful investments in it. We now have a third floor conference center um, that has been added on to the building. Do you have any, have you ever worked on or served on the board of trustees or been involved with that aspect of it? I have not, I've supported it, but I've not been on the board, no. But it's, it's a worthwhile bunch and they do a good job. I wanted to talk to you now about what it was like um, uh, I know as a judge, you had a lot of resources available to you, whether you had clerks or technology, but then going back into private practice after your judgeship, um, what did you find that had changed the most? Everything. Uh, electronic filing. Of course, I knew that, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't do it. <laughs> the electric fi e-filing came to the court. So I saw it, so I was never involved with the filing, but that's a revolution. And it, it is wonderful because as we discussed earlier, you'd have to race somewhere to get something filed and now you've got a deadline and you can e-file it at 11 o'clock at night before the deadline. And that, that's really a wonderful help, I think, not only to the lawyers, but to the system uh, as well. Uh, oh, there are so many innovations that have happened. And the transition from a judge back to a lawyer was very difficult because uh, I was simply not up to date on everything. So you had to almost start all over. And so many innovations in the law. And uh, it, it's, it's a delightful practice though. Do you find that um, legal services are as accessible or affordable as they were when you first started practice to the average citizen? Uh, of course, they're so much more expensive now, but the, mm -hmm. the cost of living is up and everything uh, as it was compared to 50 years ago. But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, depending upon your ability to pay, that some of the charges today are really substantial that a lawyer charges, and generally they're on hourly charges, hourly rate. Uh, but the things that are involved, other than principle, and it's always money, uh, sometimes is so staggering that when a lawyer gets into that, and he gives advice to somebody over a uh, three or four million dollar transaction, you sure have to know what you're doing. And when you put your signature on something, uh, I, I think it's right to make the charge. 
but uh, the uh, average situation, domestic situations and uh, uh, bankruptcy and uh, minor disputes and so forth between parties, uh, I don't think they deserve a great uh, uh, substantial lawyer's wage to transact those things, and that may not even be fair. But uh, if you, you ought to give just as much of your ability and attention to a small thing, obviously, as to a large transaction. But the tendency is just the contrary. I know that there seems to be, well, at least in Missouri, the statistics, there's more than two million cases that are filed and disposed of each year. That includes municipal courts. It's about a million cases from circuit all the way up to the Supreme Court of Missouri. Um, I know that some pursue alternative d dispute resolution or mediation. Is that something that is newer to the profession that you've seen, or was that something that also took place when you first started? Yes, ADR is new. You, the only uh, resolution of a dispute that you had, if, if you could come with one without having a trial, was for the lawyers and the clients to do it themselves. And actually, that should be done more today. But it's beneficial to have uh, an outside, purportedly unbiased person assist you, as in mediation. And that has really enlarged today. And uh, it's, uh, I think, mediation and uh, summary judgment motions, dispositive motions are settling so many of the cases. In, in the federal system, a couple of years ago, I think only 5% of the cases that were filed or tried. And that eliminates, what is the amendment? Your right to a trial. The sixth and seventh. The yeah, sixth and seventh amendments, yeah. It eliminates trial by jury almost. So it's, uh, it's too bad because so many lawyers today who would like to be litigants or litigators uh, are not because they don't have the opportunity. Cases are being settled. But on the other hand, uh, it saves a lot of time and expense if you can resolve a dispute without having to have a full-fledged jury trial. So there, that's the main argument and it's forceful. Any pieces of advice that in your wonderful experiences that you would want to share with um, you know the group of five or six hundred new lawyers that are going to be taking their oath as an officer of the court mm -hmm. next month here in September of 2019? Uh, yes, several. Uh, and you touched on those a moment ago that, that uh, the, the, the obligation to provide legal services, pro bono services, is essential. And it's actually part of the uh, last two lines of the oath, that you should remember the oppressed and the poor, I'm paraphrasing, uh, and, and take care of them. And there, there are so many people, my goodness, in domestic situations, domestic violence, uh, landlord-tenant, some of these things are so difficult that uh, you have somebody who's being evicted and, evicted and they have three little kids running around and, uh, and they don't have any money or they pay their rent or, or whatever the problem was. And so helping this kind of thing is just essential to lawyers. And, and you, you do it through the organization, Legal Services of Eastern Missouri, or you do it just on your own. Uh, a lot of times you have friends who send somebody in to see you and the friend knows that they can't pay you, but they also know that, that you're willing to help, and you should. But th that, that type of, of thing is just absolutely essential. Uh, next, uh, the work ethic. Uh, that is vital. And most, most lawyers uh, are willing to, to, uh, to work hard and, and represent their clients properly. But there are some who 
just do not. That's too bad. And if you're going to get ahead, you just have to have the work ethic. The, the other thing, uh, and you've touched on all of these, is civility. Uh, that, that's essential as well. So hard work and civility and uh, legal services and all of these things are, are so necessary for a young people starting out and for an older person as well. Are, is there anything that you'd like to say about what the having a career or profession and what being a lawyer has meant to your identity in your life? Uh, well, it's meant everything because it was something I, I wanted to do and when you get into it, uh, hopefully that it increases your ardor for it. And uh, it, it's been a, a, a nice remunerative life. There are a few lawyers who are highly successful financially. And then there are a great number of lawyers who make a very nice living, comfortable living to, to be married and raise your family and so forth. And then there are some who work extra hard to do it. But by and large, it, it, it's just remunerative, remunerative, not only financially, but to help somebody out who has a problem. And of course, it's, it, that's easy to say when you embrace a corporate entity as, as uh, compared to an individual. But most corporate entities are composed of shareholders, so you're talking about them as well. But but you're, you're performing a service, and, and the United States is a, uh, a country of laws, and it's built on the law, and the law is prevalent and must be if we're to be an organized society, a successful organized society. And, uh, you know, it's almost uh, two or three weeks, it's going to be Constitution day, the 231st anniversary of the uh, enactment of our Constitution. And that's just a fantastic set of rules for people to live by. It's, it's just amazing. It has imperfections, of course, but there's nothing as good at it. And it's based on an organization of law, and we're governed by law, and we must be. And we can change it. Do you see yourself um, in your role as a lawyer and also a judge as almost a guardian of the Constitution and of people's rights? Well, that's very nice to say. Yes, yes, I, without question. So many lawyers are very fortunate because we've had an opportunity to have clients and to work for them and to help them and to improve the administration of justice, and you do that through an organized bar and through willingness of lawyers to participate. And it, it, it's, it's, it is a group of people, lawyers, that perform a service. And of course, we get paid for it, generally. But it's, it's more than that. Uh, you know, if you've done something nice for somebody, you can go, go to bed and sleep better. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm enamored with the law and, and the role it plays in our society today. And boy, does it have responsibility, though. This is the 75th anniversary of the Missouri Bar. Yes. And um, do you, I know that there's been a lot of changes since you joined the profession in 51. Um, do you think that we'll still be going strong and at the core of it, lawyers will still be helping people solve their problems in another 50 years? If it isn't, we're in trouble. I think it will be. Now, I believe that I read that your father still came uh, into the law firm every day. 
He did up F2. to 102. Uh, he died at 104, but he, he still came into the office. People had to drive him, huh. and he came into the office. We used to kid him. He only came in on weekdays. <laughs> <laughs> only on weekdays. <laughs> yes. You, uh, we, I, when, when my dad was 90, we used to tell him, uh, Dad, you need to go out with some of your friends more. <laughs> And he said, they're all dead. <laughs> now, <laughs> and in today's world, that's not quite right anymore. We're living longer. Yes, and living much longer. Y'all do a great job. Well, we've had wonderful leaders such as yourself uh, helping set the priorities and keeping us focused on helping lawyers and helping the public. So thank you for letting us just oh, sit and night. chat this, today and this have this a wonderful a, conversation. This is I've really enjoyed it. This no. is embarrassing. No, you've done some wonderful things Listen. and you still got plenty of more time to do some more.